Leadership as an Art came out and I read the book and I realized that's the kind of leadership that I think should be. I really think we need to create organizations that are both effective and efficient organizations and vital communities of the spirit. And Max was doing that at Herman Miller. Individual needs are just as important as the needs of the organization and that they work in tandem is crucial. And with Max, he realizes that the whole is comprised of individuals. And if individuals' needs aren't met, if they're not allowed to reach their potential, then really we're not only doing a disservice to the individual, but also the organization as a whole. He seems to understand that they work together, I guess a bit like a jazz band. When I look at an Eames Time Life chair, I see an expression of a certain theology of creation that says that this is a world that God made and about which he said, this is good. While the furniture that Homer Miller has produced over the years have, have gained an iconic status as design objects, it goes so much deeper than that. I started realizing how fascinating and inspiring of a person that Max Dupree is. Having a father as a pastor and business person and talk about theology, I mean, you can't escape that sort of thing. During the Depression, Max's father would travel around the Midwest and he would look for furniture contracts for his company. He would ask his workers, is this something that you're willing to do for this price? And later on, Max talked about workers being volunteers. And I think that lesson traces back to the way his father treated his workers. I remember working with facility designers through the years saying, just give me a window. All I really wanted was a window. I have a reputation of occupying any spare work surface that's in my vicinity. I clutter, meaningful clutter. I remember a questionnaire that Max sent out to the leaders at Herman Miller. He said, would you show your workplace to your family? Uh, Max told about how his mom influenced his leadership skills. She didn't assign work based on gender to her kids. She just assigned it based on what needed to be done. At Herman Miller, he, he would take on male and female mentorees. They had some family rules, and one of the rules that they had was that even though Max loved to listen to baseball on the radio, he needed to listen to Charles Fuller, the evangelist, on the radio first. Interesting connection because when he joined the board at Fuller, Charles Fuller was still on that board. Max Dupree started working at Herman Miller when he was a teenager. He did a lot of the most low-paying jobs around the company. Yeah, Max started off at Wheaton and he was there a semester. He studied pre-med and then in April of 43, he went to war. So they were assigned to a mobile surgical unit when he was called to assist in an emergency surgery. And it was just Max and the one surgeon who was left. And Max was not a surgeon that needed to be done, but he stayed close enough that he was able to walk Max through step by step. So Max considers that an excellent example of mentorship. When I had a chance to get the, the Kellogg Fellowship, uh, I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could learn from Max Dupre? And so I audaciously wrote to him and asked him if he'd tutor me for two years. To my surprise, he said, yes, he'd be happy to. And then, to my surprise, I didn't get the fellowship. So I wrote him and said, oh, Max, I didn't get the grant. I can't do it. And I underestimated his graciousness when he responded, well, why don't we do it anyway? And that was 30 years ago, which has significantly shaped my leadership journey. I'm a 43-year employee of Herman Miller. My husband retired after 42 years working for Herman Miller, and his father retired after 35 years of working for Herman Miller. So we are born and raised Zealand, Michigan kids that put Herman Miller into a main part of our lives. He designed a system of people that allowed them to function elegantly in their jobs and in their product. And if you were to trace back the experience of the people who made this chair, they had a good experience. They could bring their whole selves to the manufacture of this chair, from the designers to the mullwrights to the people who put the leather together, everybody involved. How do we connect our practice to our beliefs? 
So much of Max's leadership revolved around that idea. These are expressions of a certain view of the world. They're expressions of a certain view of the human person that is incredibly life and hope giving. He had a premature granddaughter and a nurse named Ruth told him that he was to come every day to the hospital and he was to tell his granddaughter Zoe how much he loved her. And as he did so, he was to take his finger and stroke her body. And Ruth said, in that way, you're connecting voice and touch to Zoe. It's not just the statement of love, but it's the actual practice. In Leadership Jazz, he talks about connecting voice, which are your values, and touch. Quality of your character and, and what you can contribute to, uh, to something bigger than yourself. Throughout Leadership is an Art, uh, Max is really on the ground, he's really in integrity, he's talking sort of shop floor, factory level leadership. So he suddenly just sort of zooms out and he talks about the entire global economy. He starts with the notion of the human person being made in the image of God. Some of the, the great designers that worked in Herman Miller were these unusual people and he felt the role of the leader was to understand the unusual people and to give them room to be themselves. An annual report I worked on in 1984 is when Herman Miller announced that all employees would be owners of the company and would share in the profits and have stock. Max did that to provide a plan for them to be taken care of in case there was a hostile takeover of the company. My colleagues and I went in with two proposals. One of them portrayed every employee at Herman Miller and everyone was the same scale. And we integrated the people in top management with the people on the floor, with the people in the offices. It filled 24 spreads in this annual report. Max hardly spent any time with the second one and held up the one with all the people and said, this is our annual report. Life is about finding our potential and helping other people achieve their potential. It's not just about oneself. I do a lot of mountain climbing and I do some rock climbing, even though I don't like rock climbing. For me, the carabiner is a symbol of that choice to clip into a safety rope. And the metaphor is if you're rock climbing, and you're working up the steep rock face, your belayer has you on a rope to hold you secure. The belayer doesn't do your climbing for you. The belayer doesn't pull you up the mountain. The rope is just kind of hanging loosely attached to your harness. But if you fall, the belayer holds your rope secure so that your fall is not fatal. There's a sense in which a mentor provides that kind of a model in my mind. Has the safety rope. So a fall is not fatal, it's a learning moment in your life. And Max has been there for many stumbles, trips, and learning moments in my life. Max came up to me and introduced himself. Of course, I knew who he was. And he uh, asked me if I'd be willing to help him write a book. And I asked him whether he had anything to say. Max, to his credit, said, well, he would think about that. Good leadership. It's dependent on the leader in league with the followers. He's always been kind of modest human being. He's never forgot that, like the rest of us, he's trying his best and uh, sometimes we make it and sometimes we don't. About halfway through my tenure as president at Regent, I ran into a, a difficult conflict where it seemed to me that I could no longer exercise leadership. And I decided I needed to resign. But I couldn't resign without the blessing of my mentor. That was a highly emotional moment for me, to, to be failing in front of my mentor. And um, Max was very gracious, accepted all that, listened to my story, and agreed with me. Encouraged that my mentor still believed in me and trusted my ability to move forward. And of course that gave me the, the, the courage or the, to risk staying and resolving the problem. And I did. I stayed and we solved that problem and I went on another six years for a very successful tenure. And that's one of those moments that has stayed clearly in my mind. But we remember the things that leave an emotional mark on us too. Much of what I believe about leadership I learned from Walt. Walt would say, for example, that uh, belief shapes behavior. It's a standard uh, notion of his.
I also learned certain things about leadership by watching Walt as a leader and seeing how he has exercised his leadership. One of the things that fascinate me is that I learned certain things from Walt, Walt learned certain things from Max because Max is the direct mentor of Walt. Walt though has had a long relationship uh, with Max, years and years and years, by his example, by his teaching, but also through the most fascinating process of conversation. And so uh, one of the things that struck me is that when I'm in conversation with Walt, I learn from him because he asks really big questions. It's a leader's responsibility to ask the right questions, and I've learned a lot of uh, great questions to ask. I think there's something really interesting to learn from paying attention to that relationship, the relationship between Max and the people he mentored. Yeah, well, Max talks about legacy as what remains in the minds of people after you're gone. Part of what will always follow in Max's wake is his commitment to relationships, to listening, to encouraging, to creating space for people to realize their potential. And as I think about the idea of a legacy today, there's a very wonderful sense in which our legacy is our name. And so I'd like you to think with me about a legacy from that perspective. Again, something to remember you by. I knew Max had been inducted into the Business Hall of Fame and it was only when I was then reading Steve Jobs' biography that I realized the same day, these two. The irony for me is I was writing that article on an Apple iPad sitting at a Herman Miller desk and that prompted the comparison of the legacy of these two men. Both of them are passionate about work, both of them are passionate about art, both of them recruit creative people, both of them built great companies. Given that both left a significant legacy in this world, which legacy is going to last the longest? The one that only produces products as they both did, or the one that has produced people who have grown into the space given to them and will go out equipped and motivated to create space for other people to grow? And that legacy goes on and on and on. Max, thank you for a great 42 years. That's what I'd say. It's thought-provoking to ask yourself, how would I live if I believed the things that Max believes? How would I run a company if I believed the things about human beings uh, that he did? And so I think, you know, for us at the Debris Center, for example, we want to invite people to that kind of integrity and to ask themselves, do I live in a way that with authenticity flows out of what I believe? But I think we also want to provoke thought about how should we think about human persons? How should we think about work? How should we think about workplaces? How should we think about the global economy? And I think Max raises those questions not just by what he writes, but by who he is.